Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. No sector of the global economy has been hit harder by the COVID-19 pandemic than the travel and hospitality industry. Posh hotels like this one behind me are empty. Millions of workers in travel and tourism have been laid off. Well, my guest today is Sirocco Forte, who is the owner of a string of luxury hotels across Europe. His is a powerful voice in an industry which is now chafing against strict lockdown and social distancing rules. Is there a future for a business which relies upon mobility and public confidence? Sirocco Forte, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you very much for asking me to join you. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. And you, like everybody else, have lived through the most extraordinary three months of this COVID-19 pandemic. I wonder what impact it's had on you, both personally and professionally, in terms of your business. Well, I mean, I've, uh, um, I've had the virus and recovered from it, so... so uh... Um, uh, and uh, I'm back to full full health now. Um, uh, I never, I was never hospitalised or anything like that, uh, and it's, it was really like a very very bad flu. But um, uh, the thing that it le- is that it leaves you very weak afterwards, and it takes about a couple of weeks to really get back uh, uh, to full to full fitness after after the the symptoms are gone. Um, as far as my uh, my business is concerned, uh, like the rest of the tourist industry, uh, my, it's like a, it's as if a nuclear bomb has gone off. Um, I've never known uh, a business and never run a business with no income before. And in fact, I never dreamed of having to run a business with no income before. But that is the current situation. It's created uh, complete havoc in, in the industry. An industry... Uh, which is so important to the world economy. Uh, over over 10% uh, of the workforce in the world is employed in the tourism industry in one way or another. Uh, and in some countries, of course, it's a lot more uh, than that. Uh, so there are a lot of livelihoods at stake and lives at stake. Uh, millions of people, in fact, uh, and their families are suffering at the moment in that uh, many of them are on, in furlough and therefore not earning their normal, uh, their normal uh, level of income. Uh, and they have the prospect, if this, this thing goes on for much longer, of not being uh, able to return to jobs that will no longer be there for them uh, at the end of it. What about the differences you've noticed across your hotel business? Because, as you say, you've got hotels in Germany, you've got quite a number of hotels in Italy. I believe you've got one in St. Petersburg, Russia, and the two in London. Now, all of those countries have responded in their own way to the pandemic with their own lockdown regimes, some of which are now being eased, some of which are still in place. Have you learned any lessons from the ways different national governments have handled this crisis? Well, I think, I think uh, uh, certain governments have, have been more efficient uh, than others in, in dealing, and dealing with it uh, and uh, have reacted much more quickly than others. Um, I think in this country, uh, the, the Chancellor's uh, introduction of the fur- furlough scheme and then paying the money uh, in three weeks uh, to, uh, to the companies who'd applied for it, uh, is, quite, uh, is quite sensational. In Germany, they've been very quick too. Uh, in Italy, the process has been, uh, been a lot slower, but you have a coalition government there uh, which uh, makes it more difficult for decisions to be made and action to be taken. Let me ask you a very simple question. I've looked at some of your um, public statements since the, the crisis began and your hotels were effectively robbed of revenues, And I have to say, you sound like a businessman who, in terms of priorities, is putting his own bottom line in front of 
the collective public health. You seem to be saying to the government in the UK and other governments that their first and overwhelming priority ought to be to save the economy. In my business, uh, my people are very important to me. Um, I know a lot of them. I go around my hotels all the time. Uh, I know a lot of them individually. Uh, they are relying on me and, and, uh, and looking to me for, for support. Uh, and I'm, my, the, my biggest nightmare is, if this goes on for much longer, I'm going to have to make people redundant, not through any fault of their own or any fault of mine. And, and that, that's a terrible thing. There are a lot of livelihoods at, at stake here. Uh, and um, I, I understand that, Sirocco. Uh, but no country will improve the health of their, yes. of, their, of their nation by getting poorer. And we're facing uh, pos possibly a massive depression. Uh, I, if, I understand your, your yeah. I understand your concern for your workers and for the state of the overall economy. But when you said just a short time ago, the lockdown is an expensive and potentially deadly overreaction which should be brought to an end as soon as possible. I'm inclined to think, what on earth are you doing intervening in what is surely a debate to be had between epidemiologists, virologists, scientists and politicians? I mean, do you really believe that you have the knowledge to say that the lockdown is an overreaction? Uh, you know, I, I'm not, obviously I'm not a scientist and, and not an expert, although the scientists seem to disagree uh, quite considerably, and views have changed since the beginning of the crisis. Uh, it's the, the, the virus, uh, it now seems, is not as des deadly as people thought. Um, and a lot of, a lot of studies, uh, particularly the Stanford University study, which, uh, which is a very accurate one and is based on, uh, on the experiences in, in New York, uh, says quite clearly that uh, the risk to individuals of dying from this disease is very low indeed, and they're talking about between 0.1% and 0.2%. And, and that as far as young people in good health are concerned, there's hardly any risk at all. But, now, of but, course, but, but let's get, uh, hang on, hang on. Of course, let, every let, death is, 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 is sad, and premature deaths are a tragedy. Yes, uh, I mean, let, let, us, but, let, but, let us just take the data from uh, a host of different independent scientific an uh, analysis, which suggests that, for example, had the UK and the US imposed the lockdown, which you say is, a, is an overreaction, had they imposed that lockdown a week or 10 days earlier, it would have saved up to three quarters of the many tens of thousands of lives lost. Does that not matter to you? Well, of course, of course it matters to me. I don't want to see people dying, dying unnecessarily. But a lot of people are going to die in the future if we carry on the way we are. And unless economies open up, people are allowed to get back to work and they're not left unemployed, unemployed for a long time into the future, which will be the result if, if, if the lockdown isn't lifted quickly and, and the extreme measures related to it aren't lifted. There was the excuse at the beginning that the uh, hospitals couldn't cope, the National Health Service mm -hmm. couldn't cope, mm -hmm. uh, and that may have been a, a reason to, to impose the, the lockdown. But that's no longer the case. But, but, but uh, the intensive care units have a huge amount of capacity. The, the Nightingale hospitals up and down the country have been mothballed. So the, the, the reason, that original reason, is not there. But let me, let, and let me come scientific. back if I may. It's not about well, science. It's about uh, uh, models, models that have been created with false assumptions. Uh, and uh, initially there's 500,000 death scenario which frightened the government into, into, uh, into moving as it did. And, and, and since then, all the predictions that have come out on the various models have all been wrong. So but why the, should we, the UK, why should the UK why should we believe the, the UK, the UK government is quite clear that it is following the advice of the scientists led by the chief scientific advisor to the UK government. But I, I also I'm very mindful of your role as a as a, a boss and, and the head of a very big hotel operation. How would you feel if you got your way, the lockdown were ended, your hotels all opened up, and then in very short order, both guests and members of your staff, whether it be in the busy bars or the busy kitchens, 
ended up getting infected with a second surge of COVID-19. How would you feel about that? Well, I mean, I don't think, I don't think that's necessarily, uh, that, that's necessarily uh, an option. Um, and, and the second surge is another sort of scare story in, 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 in my mind. There's no, there's no proof of that. Uh, it's another model that has been extrapolated uh, on some assumptions, and the past assumptions have been used have been wrong. Why should these be, be any better? My, we're in touch with, I'm in touch with my employees uh, now and have been since, since lockdown, uh, some directly, uh, uh, obviously not all, and some indirectly because our hotel general managers are in weekly contact with them. They're all longing to get back to work. I'm not, uh, we're going to take all the necessary precautions, whatever government uh, government says we have to do, we will do. And we have our own protocols, which we've developed, 15 pages of them, uh, which can significantly change the processes of uh, disinfecting and sanitizing uh, the hotel uh, and, and keeping, keeping surfaces cleaned in both in public areas and in the bedroom. When we open, normally a bedroom uh, in a luxury hotel takes half an hour uh, to clean properly. It's going to take an hour to do it instead. So what do you say, what do you say to the, um, for example, the senior consultant in Birmingham, uh, Dr. Ron Daniels, who, when he was asked about whether it was time to ease the lockdown, said the reality is that the effect of a potential second wave is just so unknown that it is too risky in most health professionals' view to relax lockdown now. Are you dismissing that sort of testimony from inside the health service? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've, uh, I've, I obviously avidly read everything that's in the newspapers every day and on the internet uh, about, the, uh, about the virus. Uh, and I hear a lot of different views. I mean, there's the there's the your you know your uh, you I, I I saw your very good interview uh, with the Swedish uh, epidemiologist uh, Anders Tegnell, uh, Tegel, uh, who uh, you know and he has a a, a, a very strong view of, of how this should be handled. And but if I may say so, so uh, far, Sirocco, it's, been, it's I, been effective. Yeah, I'm and glad he's, very, you, <laughs> he's very confident that in the long run he will be proved well, right. I'm glad you saw that interview because what we've seen in the last week with the latest week of, of coronavirus data from around the world is that experts believe that in the past week, Sweden has had the highest per capita infection rate in the world. Sweden, of course, being the country which decided against imposing a lockdown. Doesn't that give you pause for thought? Well, I don't know. I haven't seen those figures, so it's very difficult for me to comment on them. But, but I mean, the head of the, uh, space, uh, the space agency in Israel, who's a general uh, and a mathematics professor, uh, uh, carried out a survey uh, across across the world, and he's fa he found that the uh, virus followed the same course, whatever actions government had taken. It sort of tended to peak around forty days, and then and then tail off between seventy and and ninety and ninety days. So we're at a, we're at a stage now uh, across uh, across Europe uh, where the infection rate is at a very low level, uh, where deaths have. have, 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 have Great, great, uh, thank God, uh, uh, moved to very low levels as well. Uh, and I think there's, there, there's an opportunity to open up the economies properly. If we carry on, uh, the, the reality with this virus, it's going to be with us a long time until there's a, a vaccine. And we've got to learn to live with it. Well, uh, in, uh, relation, let, let... in relation to other viruses and diseases that are around, well, which we've learned to live with, it's not that dramatically different. Let me pick influenza, up on that. Let, influenza let me pick in, a, in, a, yeah. in a bad year uh, reaches 28, 30,000 deaths in this country. Let, uh, let me pick up, if I may, Sir Rocco. 14,000 people a year die, die of uh, pneumonia. Let, let uh, me pick that up doesn't on... mean we lock the country down. Let, let me pick up, if I may, on that point of yours about we have to learn to live with this. One thing that you are living with right now is the reality that you're receiving or your workforce, you and then your workforce, are receiving millions and millions of pounds uh, a month from the government in terms of furlough payments. You've laid off 
a substantial part of your workforce and they're still being paid, but 80% of their wage is now coming from the government. And according to one newspaper, that's uh, cutting your monthly wage bill from over seven and a half million pounds to one and a half million. You are a Conservative Party donor. I think you're somebody who's long been identified with uh, wanting to see a smaller state and lower taxation. And yet you are now taking vast amounts of public money uh, on behalf of your workers. That will stick in some people's throats. Do you, do you understand that? that? That figure, of course, is, applies to the, the whole of my business. And only a small proportion of that applies to the, to the UK. But the reality, the reality of that, if, if I still have five million a month going out of the window, despite all, the, all, all, all of that, uh, and so... Uh, by by the end of this, it will cost me some, cost my business some fifty million. It's money which would have gone uh, into investment in new hotels, into training and development of our people, and and uh, and also into into new development. I'd have to find some way to replace that at the end of the at the end of this. But the, but the worst thing is that if if it hadn't been for that. Uh, I'd have had to lay, not only lay off, but actually dismiss a lot of my people, which would have been, uh, which would have been tragic. But you're, you're a very wealthy man. I mean, do you think there's any case for the public saying, for somebody like you, very successful businessman who's made a lot of money, maybe you should be digging a bit deeper into your own pocket to help your workforce rather than relying on the government? I'm not a wealthy man. I'm not a billionaire. I'm not someone like that. I have all my, my, my wealth is tied to my business. I have no assets outside of my business except for the house I live in. The, 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 uh, this, this was a startup a few years, 20 years ago, and it's been developed into something uh, which, is, which is worthwhile and something I'm proud of. And I'm proud of it most of all uh, because of the culture and ethos we've uh, we've created because the people who work in it feel they belong to something worthwhile and are fully committed to our approach and philosophy in, t in, in, in the care we give to our customers and, of course, the care we give to us, the staff ourselves. Yes. yes. The, the, re the, the reality, uh, no one has 50 million, even the, some of the richest people in the world don't have 50 million in my pocket. If I had it, I'd put it in. I don't, unfortunately. And, and, how, um, and my business about... is going to my, the value of my business is going to deteriorate as a result of this. So well, it's I'm, interesting. I'm suffering yes, as you, much as anybody else. You, you say the value of the business is going to deteriorate. When you look at the medium to longer term, not just the next few weeks, but looking ahead years, is there any realistic probability? Do you believe that your business can return? to the sort of revenues and profitability that you had before COVID-19. I'm thinking of the fact that we're now looking at a world where quarantine, it seems, is going to become a new fact of life. The UK government says travellers uh, coming back to the UK are going to face a 14-day quarantine. Other countries doing the same thing. Your business well, other countries, is based on other, other countries mobility. aren't doing the same thing. Uh, European countries aren't, are opening up their borders to, to foreign travel. Italy is doing so on the 3rd of June, to, Europe, to certainly to European travel within Europe. And the UK is included in, in, as in, in the list of countries that can travel, uh, travel to Italy. So it's, it's the UK government bringing in a measure very late in the day, which other countries uh, have had uh, before and are now lifting. And it's, it doesn't make any sense at all. London is an international city. It depends on, on people coming to it and visiting it, not just the tourism industry, but the whole of the London economy is dependent on uh, international trade and commerce and the ability of people to, to come to London. A quarantine is going to stop people doing that. Uh, it's not very good for the economy. It's not very good, and it's not very good for Britain or Britain's future. But but it, it, it's not even just a question of quarantine. It's also a question of public attitudes, public caution, post COVID-19, even if we get the uh, pandemic under control in most countries, it looks as though, according to public surveys, people are going to be very cautious about resuming their old behaviours when it comes to travel. The aviation industry is saying it expects several years before passenger demand returns to 2019 levels 
if it ever does. So again, for a business like yours, which depends upon mobility and travel, you may be looking at a very, very much more difficult and reduced future. Yes, well, of course, I understand that. And, and, and when we reopen, we'll, start, we'll probably open our hotels in, in September, most of our hotels, with the exception of our two Italian resorts, the one in Sicily, Verdura, and Torimaitza in Puglia, uh, where of course the inc incidents of the virus are very low in, were very low indeed, uh, which are, they have big open spaces and therefore they lend themselves to people going on holiday, even with some level of social distancing, which in, which in Italy has been reduced to one metre, by the way, uh, because operating at two metres of social distancing makes it almost impossible for a hotel or restaurant to, to, to operate. People have been terrified. The, the, the success of the government propaganda has been that it's terrified people, it's cowed them, so, insofar as people uh, spy on their neighbours and report them to the police if they have for some minor infringement. If you pass someone in, in, in the street three metres away from him, they shout at you. Uh, and when, of course, there's no, there's no real chance of any infection uh, passing at that distance. It's, 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 it's terrifying. But I was rather heartened, actually, by the photographs I saw in the papers this morning of the beaches, uh, various beaches on the south coast, which were filled with people and sunbathers. And yeah, none but, of them were uh, yeah, very much with social Rocco, distancing. Many people find those pictures deeply disturbing. And I just wonder, again, when you're running a business based upon luxury experience, the idea that you go to one of your hotels and you have a great time and you kick back and relax, the reality now is that many top-class hotels are talking about introducing mandatory uh, temperature checks on all guests as they enter. They are talking about guests having to wear gloves, uh, special surveillance cameras in all guest and staff areas, uh, masks being made available to all staff and guests. Is this really an environment in which the luxury hotel stay is going to be viable? No, of course it, of, uh, of course it isn't. And, and, uh, and uh, I don't want to be served by someone wearing, uh, wearing a mask. I mean, the whole, the whole point of uh, interaction, the interaction that you want between staff and customers can't happen. So what are you going to uh, do? In that way. But I mean, we'll have to live with it for, for, as, uh, for as, long as, as long as we can. What are you trying to say? That, uh, that, they, that I should give up? <laughs> Go shop and get, up and get the hell out of it? Well, I'm not trying to say that, Sir Rocco. I just want to end with this thought, which you're leading, to, uh, leading me towards, which is, what about the future? You've just told me that your family money is heavily invested in the hotel business. I know that you had expansion plans. You wanted to open a new hotel in China and a couple more in Europe. And you were very, you know, going back a year, you were very optimistic about the future. Has all that changed? Is your vision of expansion now on hold? And, and really, if you're honest, do you have faith that you're in a sector that has much of a future? Yes, of course I do. I mean, I've been through some difficult times in my life, as you probably know. I further the Granada takeover of a business my father founded. Uh, the financial crisis found me in, in a very difficult situation. And I've got through. I've survived both those and, 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 and moved forward again. Uh, and this is another crisis we're facing. We're facing it uh, in an intelligent, uh, in intelligent way. And we'll get through it. Uh, and uh, things will, will return. I think that by, uh, by the spring of next year, things will be, look very different. I think things look different from one week to the next, actually. Uh, the Prime Minister seems to be, according to today's papers, seems to be changing his mind already about the extent of the lockdown and talking about easing it even further in 10 days' time. So, so I don't think, uh, you know, the, the, the doom and gloomsters are always, uh, uh, always around. And the certain, I suppose, the left would be very pleased to see uh, luxury hotels uh, disappear. But I don't think that's a, that's a, a reality. Uh, and I think uh, they, uh, we will come back uh, uh, and be very successful again. So, Rocco, we, we have to end there, but I do thank you very much indeed for joining me on Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.